Hi hey folks, uh, today we're going to talk about models for ordinal dependent variables. Uh, and here if you recall what we mean by ordinal is these are variables that we know the direction of changes but we don't know the distance. Uh, for example, if we ask somebody um, on a Likert scale uh, how much they agree with something, they might say strongly disagree or they might say disagree and we know that disagree is a higher value than strongly disagree, but we don't really know by how much, right? So how much difference there is between those two groups. But we're going to start by thinking about um, what would happen if, if we didn't have these ordinal data and if instead we had continuous data. For example, assume that there's something out there that we're trying to explain. Uh, we're going to talk later about satisfaction with democracy, so that's a, a reasonable enough thing to talk about. Uh, we'll also do an example of um, state repression, so that's one that we could talk about as well. Essentially, anything that we could think about is lying on some continuum. So if we thought about satisfaction with democracy, you could imagine people being in essentially any place on this line, right? We could have people who are really satisfied way out here and people who are really dissatisfied over here, people with sort of middling preferences and then anybody anywhere in between. And if we observed this directly, what we would just do is we would do a regression of this variable on a bunch of other variables we cared about. And then that would tell us the relationship between satisfaction with democracy for example, and a bunch of other things, probably like age and education and maybe uh, liberal conservative um, ideology and things like that. Instead, however, we don't actually observe this underlying continuum. Instead, what we observe is some categorical uh, or grouped realization of that variable. For example, um, anybody who has a score anywhere in this range, we would observe as having a one. And anybody in this range here, we would observe as having a two. This makes it pretty clear what we mean by uh, ordinal and not knowing the distance between um, two separate values, right? Not knowing the distance between the group we call one and the group we call two. Because the distance could in fact be quite small. Right? So if we had these two people, the distance between what's a one and what's a two for these two people would be quite small. Whereas the distance for these other two people would be quite big. So you don't know how far apart people are who say they're a one versus those who say they're a two. We just know that the people who are two have more of whatever the underlying property is, and in this case, satisfaction with democracy, than those people who call themselves a one. You can see the space here is divided by what we would call either cut points or thresholds. Uh, these little tau parameters that you see here are the parameters or are the uh, values that divide this space up into different groups. And you can see with three of these different cut points, we have four different possible categories. Technically, there are two other cut points that we don't really observe. Um, there's one way out here. Tau 4 is equal to positive infinity. And there's one way out here. Tau 0. Uh, that doesn't really look like infinity. Uh, is minus infinity. We'll come back to why it, it makes sense for us to talk about those things in a little bit, um, but just so you have a sense of uh, how things work. That's how we think about this continuum being divided up to make uh, a bunch of categories. If we wanted to put this in mathematical notation, um, we would say something like uh, something like this. 
uh, that for any observation y, um, it equals a particular value m if the y star, so this is the uh, this is the value the value on the latent continuum. If this is between um, the m minus one and the mth cut point. So, for example, we could say y is equal to two if uh, tau one less than equal y star less than tau m. Oh, sorry, tau two. Right, so y is equal to 2 if y star is between tau 1 and tau 2, the two cup points that are on either side of that. Now, because we've got a categorical variable, it's not something that we can use in a regression um, or in an OLS regression like we would with a continuous variable. Instead, what we really want to do is characterize the probability that y takes on any one of these categorical values. And to do this, we'll need to assume a probability distribution for the errors in that latent model that we talked about before. Our choices here are really just two, although I suppose we could use others, but the two most common ones are we could choose the normal distribution in which case we get what's called the ordered probit model. Or we can use the logistic distribution, in which case we get the ordered logit model. Both of these models make an assumption about the variance of the errors on the underlying dimension. In the probit model, that variance is equal to 1. Uh, and in the logit model, it's equal to pi squared over 3. Uh, you don't need to worry about these things because it's not it's important in the sense that we need to make some assumption, but which assumption we make is actually not that important, right? We got two models that do almost uh, exactly the same thing. We're going to stick with the logit model because that's what we've looked at all along, but we could generate basically the same results with the order probe model as well. If we want to think about how the probability distribution fits in, um, with these various categories. Let me make a little drawing. So let's say we've got our latent continuum here. And we've got tau 1, tau 2, tau 3. By assuming a probability distribution, what we're really saying is that we can put a distribution over uh, this line. So our predicted value would be in the middle of this distribution. I'll use a different color here. It would be in the, in the middle of this distribution, say here. Uh, and so the predicted value would govern where the middle of the distribution is. So in this case, we'd have one that's centered sort of right around tau 2. But we could imagine having a different one, say, that was centered more over tau 1. Let's stick with the one that's over tau 2 for the moment. The way that we would figure out the probabilities is by considering these cut points, right, and then finding the area to the left of the cut point value. Right, so in this case, this is the probability that y equals 1. In fact, we might also write it as the probability that y less than equal 1. Right, because it's the first group, those are the same. Pick a different color. Um, if we're looking at the second group, 
So now if we take all the area to the left of here, right, so this is the probability y less than or equal to 2. Right, so for any one of these cut points, we could generate the probability that y is less than or equal to that value. And so if we only have three cut points, we have uh, groups one, two, three, and four. If we wanted to know what's the probability that y is less than or equal to four, that's just one, right? Because we would be looking at what's the, this is also the probability that y star less than infinity. Right, because that's the cut point that's way out uh, on the right hand side of this distribution. Okay, so if we're comfortable with that, um, we've I've written the equation out here uh, just so you have a sense of what it looks like. So here's probability y less than or equal to m. This is the Oh, oh, sorry. This is the notation for the logistic distribution uh, CDF. Um, here's our cut point. Our threshold parameter. And here is our linear predictor. So just, this is just the sum of the coefficients multiplied by their respective x values. This is how we would um, turn those uh, x, b's, and thresholds into actual probabilities, right? 1 over 1 plus e to the minus, and then tau minus x, b. So we talked before about what's finding the probability of being less than or equal to a particular category, right? And we said that's um, this thing here. What if we wanted to know the probability of being exactly in the second category, not in two and one, but just in two? Well, if we think back to what we had before, I'm gonna draw a little bit of it right here. Right, and I'm just going to put in tau 2 and tau 1. Right, so we said tau 1. This is the probability y less than equal 1. And here we have the probability y less than equal 2. So if we want to know what's the probability of being in exactly in 2, we would have to subtract from this orange bit the blue bit over here. Right, so what we're really doing then is we're saying what's the probability of less being less than or equal to 2, and we're subtracting from that the probability of being less than or equal to 1. And this leaves us with just the probability that y equals 2. And we could calculate those probabilities in the same way that we talked about above using the logistic CDF. So before we get into um, an applied example, I want to tell you a little bit about what the likelihood function looks like. So here for an individual observation, just like in the binary logit model, the likelihood is the probability that the observation takes on its observed value. In this case, the likelihood uh, for an individual observation i, right, would be um, let's call this the probability that y hat uh, less than or equal to yi. Uh, 
And this is, this one is the probability that y hat, our predicted value, less than or equal to yi minus 1. So if our observed value was 2, then we would have, this part would be the probability that our prediction is less than or equal to 2, and this part would be the probability that our prediction is less than or equal to 1. So we would take those two, subtract them, and that would give us the probability that we have uh, observed the value that we have in y. And you'll notice here that the subscript to tau here is y sub i, and here is y sub i minus 1. Right, So that allows us to flip between different groups um, as we have different observed values of y. The log likelihood, just as in the binary logic example, is just the log of this predicted probability. Right, so even though the mechanics are a little bit different, uh, the idea is still pretty much the same. We're going to talk about an example uh, that helps us uh, figure out how to interpret these models. The example data that we have here, our dependent variable is called SDFAC. So this is a, a categorical variable uh, based on the State Department country reports that generate a score of state repression. And these are integer values that go from 1 to 5. We have two dummy indicators for war, one for uh, civil war and one for interstate war that both come from the Correlates of War project. I have the log of population and the log of per capita GNP, and then an index of democracy. And just to note, um, we're going to look at, um, in the slides you're going to see a summary function that's a little bit different than you would see um, if you just used what's in the mass package. Uh, what's in the mass package doesn't produce p-values for you. Uh, and so there's a function if you source in the code um, from the R file for this lecture, you'll have a new summary and a new print summary function for um, ordinal dependent variable models, and it will give you exactly what you see in the slides. Uh, so I'm loading the foreign and the mass package. You could also switch colors back. You could also use the Rio package here and use import here. That would be more similar to what we've done so far. Um, but this way works too. We're also loading the mass package. Um, and there's a function in the mask package called POLR. Uh, which stands for Proportional Odds Logistic Regression. Uh, the first thing I'm doing is I'm making sure that my SD underscore fact variable um, is a factor. And then I estimate a model of this new factor on all of the independent variables just so I can show you that it works. I'm putting a polynomial on the democracy index variable. Um, and then you'll see what we get is a pretty usual regression output, right? We get coefficients right, these are the B values. We get standard errors of the coefficients, a Z statistic, and a P value. You'll note that uh, it looks like in all of these cases, they're all significant. What we get different than we have gotten before 
is we get information on the threshold uh, parameters. These are the tau's. And this just tells us where each of those um, is. Um, and it gives us standard errors and Z statistics and p-values as well. Uh, these are kind of hard to interpret on their own. Um, so it's probably not worth um, spending a lot of time trying to interpret the threshold parameters. Um, it's necessary for us to estimate them to get probabilities out of the model. But beyond that, there's not a lot of um, sort of actionable information in here. Uh, the one thing that you could look for, I suppose, if you were interested, is to see how how much distance there is between each one. Right? There's some advice out there that you might read that would say, if all of these threshold parameters are equidistant, then that would give you sort of some comfort in using an OLS model on this dependent variable rather than an ordered logit or ordered probe model. Um, but I, I probably would stick with this kind of model anyways because I think it's, it's probably better suited to the kind of outcome variable that we have. Just like before with binary logit models, the coefficients are a little bit hard to interpret on their own. Right, so we can't look at them and immediately find out their effect for all of the same reasons that we couldn't do it um, with a binary dependent variable models. Before we move on to testing effects though, I just want to show you that the uh, big A ANOVA function still works just like it did in all the other models we've talked about. Um, so in all the occasions where it would make sense to use that, you can use that. And there's a function in the DA MISC package called prob group. And this uh, plots a histogram of the probabilities of observations. taking on their observed values. Right, so here this is really just um, the probability of being a one for all of the observations that are actually ones in the data set. Here's the probability of being a five for all of the fives in the data set. What we would like to see is probably something that looks more like this one or this one, where we have not that many low values and some values that are up toward the middle. It's unlikely that we're going to see a lot of values way up toward one. Um, but if we see a bunch of values that are up toward the middle of the distribution, that would tend to be uh, probably a pretty good sign. Um, we're less interested in seeing stuff like what's going on in the other panels. Here we have a lot of observations that are actually fives that have predicted probability of being five that's pretty small, right, close to zero. And with the ones, we've got basically what looks like a uniform distribution. So among the ones, there are just as many that have really low probabilities of being a one as there are have really high probabilities of being a one. So again, we're looking for more like what's going on in two and three than we are in one, four, and five, but we don't have that much control over this either, right? The way that we can control this is by better specifying the model, using more or better controls, um, or making sure that we've got the functional forms of variables right. So when we think about interpreting uh, the coefficients in the model, just like with the uh, binary logit model, um, we can one thing we can think about is looking at the discrete change of a variable. Just like before the discrete change, uh, we called this before we called this the first 
difference. But it means the same thing. Uh, it's just the difference in two predicted probabilities. Uh, and they're predicted probabilities where we hold everything but one variable constant. And then we move one variable around from a starting value to an ending value. So this really just gives us the difference in a predicted probability by moving one variable around and holding everything else constant. None of this should be new or surprising to you since we've done this all uh, pretty much already, uh, but in a different context. Uh, I wanted to show you how this works because it's using the polynomial um, in some of these functions can get a little bit weird, especially if we don't, um, if we're not using raw equals true. If we use raw equals true, this all should work out without the extra steps that we're doing here. So here what we're doing is we're just estimating the poly function, and then we're pulling from that the coefficients that it estimates. So it estimates some normalizing coefficients in the background. We never see these normally, which is fine. Um, but in this case, we're going to need them uh, because the uh, discrete change function is going to need them. Uh, here we're changing interstate war and civil war into factor variables. And we're re-estimating the model. And notice that what we add to the poly function is just telling it what the coefficients are from having estimated the poly function above. So we can use the ORD change function. Again, this does the MER approach, the marginal effects at representative values approach. And here we're looking at a standard deviation change uh, in the uh, variables. What we get here is quite a lot of information, actually. So let's look at one line, for example. So let's look at the let's look at the log of GDP per or GNP per capita line. So that says as this goes up by one standard deviation, then the probability of being a one increases significantly by 0.07 about. And the probability of being a four or a five, these are really repressive countries, decreases by about 0.036 and about 0.013, uh, respectively. The stars here mark the significant changes, right? So we see that there are a couple in here um, increasing log of GNP by a standard deviation doesn't have any significant effect on being on the probability of being in the two or the three category. So just like before, this is information that you can use to help um, tell your readers what your findings mean, right? What causes significant changes? If you look at the three column here, what you see is that there are essentially no variables that result in significant changes of being a three. Um, and every variable has a significant effect on being a five and being a one. Um, so again, those are other things uh, that you could tell your readers as well. So again, in the DA MISC package, there's a function called um, OC2 plot, and that just takes the results that we saw on the last slide and makes a plot out of them. Right, so here we see, if we look at the log of GNP per capita, which is here, here's the significant increase of being in the first group and the significant decrease of being in the fourth and fifth group and the insignificant changes uh, of being in the second and third group. If we wanted the AME, the average marginal effects approach instead, uh, we could use uh, we could use the or change two function. This is also uh, in the DA MISC package. Uh, 
the results that you get are interpreted in exactly the same way. And you can see that by and large, the results sort of work out in a similar fashion. The big difference being now, none of these changes are statistically significant, right? It's only um, the probability of being in group one or five that changes as a function of changing these variables. Otherwise, the changes are on about the same order of magnitude as they were before. Right? I guess the big difference um, probably being this one here. Right, so this was uh, minus 0.17 about in the last slide, and so that got a little bit bigger. Otherwise, they're about the same. Another difference is using this approach, uh, democracy doesn't actually have any noticeable effect. Uh, doesn't have any noticeable effect on uh, the probability of being in any one of those groups. So changing democracy doesn't, doesn't ever induce a statistically interesting change um, in uh, being in any one of those groups. Uh, and just like before, we can use the OC2 plot function. Uh, to plot the predicted probability changes by each uh, category as well. Uh, again, the same as we saw uh, in the last plot. Uh, the effects package works here too. Um, so here you see we're plotting the effect of the log of population. Here we can see that the probability of being in group one decreases drastically with a log of population. So as population increases, we tend to get drastically less likely to be in group one, the low repressive states. Um, we tend to be most likely to be in group two when we're sort of in the, in the low middle of log of population and group three when we're in the sort of high middle. As population increases, um, we get increasingly more likely to be in groups four and five. Uh, we get more or less the same kind of thing if we use the AME approach. Uh, you can do th this with the ORD -AV -F plot that's in the DA MISC package. Um, and again, you can see a pretty similar thing um, happening here. Uh, the effects may in some cases be a little bit bigger and in some a little bit smaller. Um, just because of the slight difference in the way that we're calculating the probabilities. Uh, there's an ORD fit function that gives you the uh, measures of fit for the ordinal dependent variable model. Again, we got a, a bunch of adjusted R square measures that you can look at and use if you like. We also get the proportional reduction in error. Um, this is calculated the same way, still just using the proportion in the modal category and their proportion correctly predicted. Since there are more groups here, it tends to be the case that we get bigger PREs because the proportion in the modal category is usually smaller than it would be um, in a binary logit model. Uh, there's one assumption uh, that we didn't talk about, that in addition to the assumptions that we usually make with our models, uh, and this is called the parallel regressions assumption. This assumes that the relationship between x and y doesn't change from one value of y to another, right? So that the relationship between x and y is the same for each category. The null hypothesis here is the parallel regressions assumption holds, and the alternative is that it doesn't. The test for the parallel regressions assumption is called the Brandt test. And essentially what it does is it both imposes the assumption first that all of the variables act the same way regardless of the, um, of the category of the dependent variable. Uh, and we estimate that model right here. 
Note that we're doing this with a function called CLM, which is in the ordinal package. The next thing that we do is we relax that assumption for all the variables. So here we have our first formula, sorry, which just has an intercept in it. And then in this nom um, argument here, we have a right-hand sided formula. That's this thing right here that has all the variables in the same form that they were in the formula up above. Then we use an ANOVA of these two, um, and again, the null here uh, is that this assumption holds, uh, and the alternative is that it doesn't. Um, here we see that the p-value is uh, really small, so we reject the null that this assumption that we make holds in favor of the alternative that it doesn't. So what happens if it doesn't? If it doesn't, we need a more flexible model. And that more flexible model that we'll use is called the multinomial logit, and we'll talk about that next.